the storm gathers. Its shadow envelops mankind. It is the eve of cataclysm. History is being written. In this film, the historic hours of Britain's entry into war are recaptured for you by camera. How did the people of England act in their great emergency? Those two memorable days carry a momentous story for future generations. crisis has been blowing up for a fortnight. At the Mother of Parliaments, the heart of democracy, members have been in session during their normal holiday. In Downing Street, where the Prime Minister resides, first the Polish ambassador, then the German chargé d'affaires are visitors. Opposition leaders, as well as cabinet members, are called into conference. Though the situation is acute, war is not absolutely inevitable, we are told. But how it is to be avoided, no one can imagine and the preparations for civil defense go on resignedly. Such scenes as these are familiar to every country in Europe. It's a tragic thought that the menace of the air should instill the fear of death and destruction into the peoples of all nationalities, whether destined to be friend or neutral. However, Britain is prepared. Enormous strides have been made in the year since the September crisis of 1938. The personnel of the defense forces have increased rapidly in the face of danger. The balloon barrage and the anti-aircraft units inspire that confidence which comes from knowledge of one's own strength. Outside Buckingham Palace, the King's sentries pass from peacetime scarlet to service khaki. The relieving guard wears steel helmets, which henceforth will replace the magnificent bearskin. War is not inevitable, but the chances of peace are slender indeed, and the hospitals are evacuated of their patients, young and old, who go to places of greater safety. How pathetic that these innocent human beings, in the midst of their suffering, should have to endure the threat of misery to come. Evacuation looked like being a big ordeal, yet so skillfully had the schemes been planned, and so willing was the help forthcoming, that the immense emptying of Britain's cities was carried out with almost the air of routine. The departure of the schoolchildren was, in particular, a triumph of orderly precision. From the crowded towns, children in their thousands left homes and parents behind and went away to live in the safety zones under the care of their teachers. And here, another consoling thought, most of the youngsters went away cheerfully enough. For them, fortunately, the whole procedure seemed to hold no terrors and was even regarded as a holiday. With food and clothing provided by their parents, and each carrying a gas mask, they entrain for their excitingly unknown destination. How long will they be away? How long before they again return to live under the same roof with their parents? For most of them, it is the beginning of a long period in new surroundings. The routine of their young lives has been shattered by the high politics of nations, by events such as those of which they read in their history books, but hardly yet connect with themselves. It is indeed a strange experience for these thousands of children, as well as a great responsibility for those who are charged with their care during these heavy days. But the appeal of these homeless youngsters was one which captured the sentiments of the country districts, and the country districts cared for them with motherly solicitude. Parliament meets again as the crisis moves on to its climax. At six o'clock on Saturday, Mr. Chamberlain with his wife again leaves for the Houses of Parliament. It is now that Britain gives the final warning through the ambassador in Berlin. If German troops are not withdrawn from Poland, Britain goes to Poland's aid with all the resources at her command. The issue is set forth clearly. Britain will fight in the cause of her ideals. Tradition is set aside when the King goes to Downing Street for conference with Mr. Chamberlain. 
a graceful thought to save the anxious and hard-worked Premier a journey. 11 o'clock, an hour sacred to Britain for its association with armistice. 11 o'clock on Sunday, September the 3rd. The government's final warning to Hitler has been ignored and a state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. Arriving at Westminster to hear the ominous decision, statesmen set a good example, thereafter universally followed, by carrying their gas masks. Following the declaration of war, the cabinet has been reformed. Mr. Anthony Eden is now secretary for the Dominions with special access to the war cabinet. Mr. Churchill, as in 1914, is first Lord of the Admiralty. Here are some figures of the previous government, Sir John Anderson, who becomes Home Secretary, and Sir Kingsley Wood, who remains Secretary of State for Air. Sorrowfully from the House comes the Premier, whose efforts for peace, pursued unremittingly, have finally been brought to naught. Only 25 minutes after war has been declared comes the first air raid warning. This was the opportunity for the people of Britain to demonstrate their traditional calm in the face of danger. There was no sign of panic. Men and women in the streets made their way quickly to the nearest shelter and queued up in orderly processions at the entrance. all clear. Although the alarm proved to be a false one, it was a swift reminder of what war now means to the civilian and a dramatic introduction to the new order of things. Evidence that the nation is in earnest can be seen in every street of London. Notices calling out the territorial army appear on walls and hoarding. Recruiting depots open for the thousands of men anxious to join the colours. London's taxes are pressed into the service of the fire brigade. There are fewer wayfarers and they all carry gas masks. Mattresses are installed in government offices where civil servants overwhelmed with war work may rest. Meanwhile, here's the last picture of Herr Kott, the German chargé d'affaires, as he leaves the embassy and drives away en route for Berlin. As for other foreigners in Britain, they have to report, of course, and satisfy the authorities of their good faith. War always involves inconveniences for neutrals who are not concerned, but Britain endeavours to extend just and courteous consideration to all the aliens within her gates, including, as they do, many refugees from countries which have been overrun. But despite the changes and interruptions of normal life, the business of the country must go on, and the rush hours show very little diminution of travelling. For many of these people, it's a case of going to the office now and performing air raid precaution duty later in the day. The common tasks of everyday work are not the least important aspect of the war, which from now on will absorb the whole thoughts of the nation as it musters its manhood in arms. So within a few days, the people of Britain adapted themselves to the new conditions and set about winning the war with that cheerfulness which never fails them in emergency. The scene of events shifts from London to the countryside where Tommy Atkins is on the march. Come, 